Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hold on a second. Okay. So you are live. Uh, uh, before that, um, Puan Salwa, uh, are you able to see our live streaming on YouTube? Can you please check on my behalf? Because, kalau tidak, you know, I fear that there will be like, uh, um, I I have to go through. I mean, I have to see this uh, live via Zoom meeting. So, are you able to to see it on YouTube or anyone else? Um, uh, even the buddies, are you able to view me on YouTube? Is the YouTube live okay? Okay, it's live. Thank you so much, Amira. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Sofia. All right, thank you so much for the response. Okay, so assalamualaikum and a very good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Nchi Ilyas, and together with us today, we have uh, obviously our um, speaker who will be delivering a talk on idea pitching, uh, uh, Nchi Fatah Abdul Ghani, and also uh, two lecturers teaching uh, two groups. Uh, we have Puan Salwa and also uh, Nchi Aizat. Um, today we are going to listen. To, um, it's it's like a talk, um, just a short lecture. You can call it a lecture or even a sharing session uh, from our distinguished speaker, Nche Afata, which later I'll be giving a bit of himself, uh, Nanti, explain a bit about, about him. But then again, I need to hold on, yeah? I disable chat me. Okay. All right. So let me just introduce our distinguished speaker. Um, Encik Fata. Okay, so um, Encik Fata born and raised in Pruang, Johor. Okay, and Encik Fata happens to be my uh, my friend, my dear friend, because we the both of us we did together our uh, uh, bachelor in education Tassel. Okay, uh, and then he graduated with bachelor of education Tassel first class honors uh, from UITM Shah Alam. All right, and then he went to do a, a Master of Applied Linguistics in UPM Serdang, and then um, Head of English Department, uh, Me Light Educational and Training Resources. It's Malin. Malin, sorry. <laughs> Malin, Educational and Training Resources. Uh, so from 2010 to 2014, and currently he is a lecturer, English lecturer. Uh, at Academy of Language Studies, UITM Negeri Sembilan, right? Okay, uh, so he has actually won a lot of medals, actually, when it comes to innovation. So um, gold medals for ECONDEF, Southern Zone, National Zone, and then a few other medals, a silver medal for ECONDEF as well, and also a gold medal for IDEX and Microsoft. Okay, very active and very innovative. So that's a bit about our distinguished speaker, Encik Fatah. So um, with that, I pass the floor to you, Encik Fatah. Okay, thank you very much, moderator, uh, Mr. E, as you are common, com commonly known among students, right? Okay, uh, let, uh, let us start by me sharing my screen, uh, my, my slides. Uh, is it there? Can you see it? Okay. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, first of all, good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizing team, uh, Mr. E, Ponsawa, and Mr. Aizat for inviting me. Um, also to uh, whoever's, uh, who, whoever's watching on YouTube Live, uh, colleagues and students have been informed that some of my, my friends also uh, participating in this session. I don't know for what is it, um, but I guess we are welcoming everyone today, so it's okay, all right. So as mentioned by Mr. E just now, uh, a little bit about my, my background, okay? Why I am particularly interested in uh, ELC 590 is because uh, this, particularly in this segment, which is uh, about idea pitching, okay? Because uh, uh, from my own background, when before I became uh, a lecturer in UITM, I was working in the corporate sector and working in uh, my previous working uh, background involves me doing a lot of pitching um, almost weekly sometimes. Whenever we have ideas to 
to implement or uh, when whenever we have actions to to enact in our organization last time we have to pitch it to our board of directors so uh, pitching is something that is uh, very close to my heart and I do it very, very often. Okay. And also, whenever I have the time, I like to I like to participate in a lot of competitions, conferences, and so on. So those platforms, although they come from uh, various backgrounds and they have different names for it, but essentially they are they are all uh, still uh, something to do about idea pitching as well. Okay, so uh, that's why I think uh, I am particularly interested in the topic for today. And uh, I guess I would be sort of the right person to be delivering this topic. Hopefully it will be uh, good and beneficial to, to everyone listening. Okay, so I know in the poster it is uh, stated the title is how to elevate your, your idea pitching. Uh, but the, the title that is appearing on my slide right now is slightly different, but I promise you it's about the same thing. Okay, so before we can go into how to elevate your pitching, we have to understand first what pitching is all about, the basics and fundamentals. Okay, so uh, when it comes to pitching, uh, it, can, it can come from uh, in, in various forms, in various ways. Okay, but first things first, you need to know the definition. Okay, so... Uh, a lot of people will have come up with their own definition. There are various definitions available out there about what a pitch is. Okay, but uh, for me particularly, uh, I personally like this this idea or this definition coming from Scott Birkin. He's a business author who have authored a, a lot of business related books. Okay, so basically, to him, a pitch is when you are bringing an idea, your own idea, to someone with the power to do something with it. Okay, so this is something that we have to understand. And sometimes uh, we have the ideas, but we do not necessarily have the influence or the authority to enact that, those ideas uh, in a way that we like. Okay, but nevertheless, we have a good idea and we know we want to do something with it. Okay, so that's why pitching is something very, it, it, that, that is very, very important. You want to bring it forth to people that can actually do something about it. Okay, so in the hopes that when you are able to do it, your idea will be actually be useful to some people or your target audience. Okay, and I would have to agree with Mr. Birkin also. There are a lot of things uh, in this day and age that are, you know, as great as they are now, they all began with humble beginnings. They all started with the very simple ideas, the best softwares, the, the best policies, the best movies, music changes, organization changes, business plans, and so on, all of them began with an idea pitch, okay? So if you were to read up on some of the current things that are uh, the big things nowadays, things like TikTok or Twitter or Instagram, they do not just, you know, like suddenly become an overnight success. They all began with somebody having an idea on what to do with those items. And then, of course, across uh, multiple years, they develop it further and it became the product they, that, that we know them as, uh, as they are today, okay? So the point is, a pitch always begins with an idea from someone, okay? Whether you are developing it individually or as a group, uh, as long as you have a clear structure to it, you have a clear direction with it, you can go on with it, okay? So why is it important for, why is it important for you to do idea pitching? Okay, so I'm just, uh, I'm talking in, uh, re with regard to the, the requirement of the course, ELC 590, and also um, I will be relating a lot to uh, the industry also later on, okay, how it can actually be useful for you, the skill that you're learning right now, how it can actually be useful for you, even after you finish your studies, even when you go out and start your career and so on, okay, so idea pitching is always about improving something okay it is part of innovation uh, actually okay so when you are in a system when you are involved in a particular field of study or industry you will be able to get first-hand knowledge of how things work okay and if you are in it long enough you will see that sometimes certain processes or certain proce procedures can actually be improved further because this is based coming from you you are the one who are undergoing all these procedures and so on, okay? So when you pitch an idea, the goal is, of course, to improve something, whether it is at a small scale, at individual scale, or a medium scale at the organizational level, or on a larger scale at the national level. It all begins with an idea, 
Okay, uh, you just have to understand that you have to be patient with it. Okay, pitching ideas sometimes in order for it to be uh, effective, fully effective, sometimes can takes uh, it, it can sometimes take takes years uh, for for it to happen. So you just have to be uh, patient with that. All right, and then uh, through idea pitching also, if you attend enough idea pitching sessions, not just your own, yeah, you have to listen to other people pitching their ideas as well. So through listening to other people's ideas and so on, you can also discover new things that opens up a lot of new possibilities for your own growth as well. So if you are able to make a discovery that is completely new, okay, that is uh, utterly critical to, uh, to, to a, a group of people or to a nation, in fact, this is where you can, you can credit yourself as the founder or the discoverer of that idea. And who knows, it can lead you to become a rich person one day. Okay. And most importantly, if let's say the, the idea pitching that you are, you are doing today, it doesn't work. Okay. Maybe uh, the idea pitching that you do today uh, didn't manage to garner enough support from investors and so on. Uh, you just have to remember that failing once doesn't mean you fail forever. There is always something for you to take out of the idea pitching sessions that you have attended. Most importantly will be networking opportunities with other people who are also interested in forwarding their ideas through idea pitching and so on. Okay, so uh, whether your idea is accepted immediately or later, the important thing is you learn along the way. All right, so that's why I would always uh, encourage my students particularly to always try and be active in idea pitching. Okay, in the beginning, of course, when you have no, no, no experience yet, you will feel like your idea is rubbish. Okay, to be, to be honest, sometimes a lot of people feel that way. They don't know how to start. They don't know what to do. When they are forced to do it anyway, they will always feel inferior to other people. But that is, I would say, a, a good starting point. Okay, the, the, the important thing is you need to start somewhere. If you think you start at a rubbish level, then do something about it. Over the years, you will, you will slowly and slight, uh, see slight changes and improvement in your performance when, you come, when, we can, when it comes to pitching your ideas. Okay? All right. So what are you supposed to do when you want to do idea pitching? Okay? So I'll break it down into four uh, different steps. Yeah? The process. First, you need to be able to identify what exactly is your pitch about. Okay? Because when it comes to pitching, there are a lot of things that you can pitch to your audience or your, uh, your target market, for example. We'll go into full details in a bit. And then once you have identified your pitch uh, correctly, you will have to outline the, the presentation in a way that will make it easier for people to follow through your ideas. Okay. After that is done, you need to practice your delivery. And once you are confident enough with your delivery, you can actually do it for real in front of your target audience. And then after you are done, you can actually do a, sort of like a post-mortem or a feedback analysis on what worked during the delivery process, what didn't work, and find out the reasons why. Okay, so the processes here would uh, simply break it down into things that you have to do before the delivery of your pitch, during the pitch, and also after the pitch, what you can actually do. Okay, uh, are we okay so far? All right, thank you. Okay, moving on. Now, the first step that I, I would always like to for, for students to consider is the things that you have to do before you do your idea pitching, okay? So I'll, I'll break it down to the very basic step, which is to identify what is your pitch exactly, okay? So in this, um, in this stage, whether you are doing it individually or as a group, this is the part where you really have to sit down and think for yourself. Is your pitch focusing on an idea, a product, or a policy? Okay, you need to break, break this down in a way that will make it clearer for you yourself to present. Okay, if you have the capability to present a policy, which is usually on a large scale, you can move on with that. If you do not have that kind of um, platform, maybe you can start on a, on a simpler platform, which is on an idea or a product level. Okay, so whether you want to do an idea, product, or policy pitching, it depends on you and whatever resources that are available to you and whatever opportunities are presented to you. Okay, but for beginning, um, for the beginning step, I would say you can start with an idea first. Okay, we start small and then you can maybe grow into uh, the bigger levels later. 
All right. Once you have identified what exactly you are pitching, you can decide which one will be the most suitable uh, for your pitching context. Okay. Uh, context here can, can refer to various things. Okay. For example, it can refer to the field that you're presenting to, or it can be the, the industry you're involved in, etc. and etc. Okay. For example, if your idea that you want to develop an app, for example, app falls under the category of technology, for example. So by identifying that clearly, it will make it easier for you to find your target audience later and how to cater to this kind of audience, okay? If you want to pitch a product, for example, it is very important for you to know what kind of product it is because without knowing the type of products, how are you supposed to, you know, expand later on the benefits and, and the potential uh, uh, return of investments and so on, okay? So once you have identified the context, then you can move further to decide on whether the, the pitch can be broken down into either one of the following, okay? So pitching, like I said, uh, it would be interesting if you can introduce an innovation, okay? So uh, when you pitch an idea, usually it's because you want to do something. So in a way, that is already an innovation in itself. Okay, but what type of innovation are we talking about? That is why, uh, that is what you have to decide for yourself with your idea pitch. Okay, so it could be a minor tweak that is all uh, about something that is already in existence. Okay, so this is the most basic step uh, that you can start with. Or if you have already done this or you have a better idea, you can go on and introduce a new future or an enhancement to something that is already existing. It's no longer something minor. You are introducing a complete en enhancement altogether. Or you would want to introduce a major new area of an existing idea, product, or policy. Okay. Let's say, for example, if um, uh, you want to decide that an app, you know, you want to improve an app. For example, let's say Waze app. Okay. At the moment, Waze is only available in our phones. Okay. Um, maybe you want to enhance it further to be able to be uh, for you to be able to use it in other devices, let's say in your car or even in your motorbike. Okay, because let's face it, for a lot of Grab riders, for example, okay, they use uh, a lot of them use waste, for example, right, on their motorbikes, and that can be quite dangerous. So maybe that is one thing that you would want to improve on because you know, you want to improve on the safety of these Grab riders because without them, our food will not arrive. Who knows, okay? And then you can also propose an entirely new project altogether that nobody has thought of, okay? So in order for you to do the, the last one, of course, a lot of uh, background research will be necessary because you want to make sure that your idea is completely new, okay? Nobody has thought about it before and this is usually the ones that people would strive for. Okay, when you introduce something that is completely new, uh, a complete new, uh, completely uh, new innovation that nobody has thought of, this is where you can actually uh, delve into a lot of possibilities on how to make yourself rich, for example. Okay, so if let's say um, you have decided on either one of the following, then the, this is the part where you can actually move forward with your pitch. Okay. Uh, by the way, these are all adapted from uh, the book Myths of Innovation, available on the market. Uh, I'm not marketing on behalf of this author. I just happen to like the book a lot. Okay. All right. So uh, examples of what kind of idea, product, or policy that you can pitch to your audience. Okay. It can even be. Um, you know, sometimes people have this imposter syndrome. They feel like they have, they clearly, we all have ideas on our, of our own, right? But the difference usually is how confident we are in our ideas, okay? Uh, so I would always say to my students, if you are uncertain whether your ideas are viable or not to, to be uh, presented in a pitch, always engage with other people and get their feedback, okay? That is how you can actually move forward with it. That's why in this course, ELC 590, your lecturers are available to help you. You can discuss with them whether your ideas are good enough for the pitch, or if not, what else can be done to improve it, okay? So uh, I would say to my students, always start with something small, something that you know, something that you're familiar with. So for example, maybe, you know, uh, students have 
sometimes students have problems to commit to make a group assignments, for example. So maybe you can come up with an idea on how exactly can you improve group um, assignments between students, particularly those who are unfamiliar with one another. You know, because usually when you make group assignments with friends, you won't have much of a problem with that, right? But, you know, sometimes lecturers will force you to make assignments with people that you are complete strangers with. So this is where sometimes uh, it can become a problem to some students. So uh, if you have thought of an idea on how to tackle this, why not pitch an idea on it, okay? Uh, other than that, if let's say you want to pitch a product, it can be, product can come in various forms, okay? It can be an app, it can be uh, a, a, a completely new device altogether, or it can be something that can be consumed by people. Okay, so with each and every product, there will always be pros and cons. So it is as the one that is pitching the, uh, the, the idea or the product, you need to decide or you need to research on what would be the benefits or the hazards of the product for you to tackle for, uh, later on, all right? Or if you are already thinking big, you can also look on pitching ideas for a policy change, okay? Like for example, uh, plagiarism among students are very rampant, okay? So uh, for students who are doing it, this is actually considered cheating, okay? But uh, for those students who are clearly trying to avoid it, um, sometimes they find, they, they find themselves in a predicament that they feel like it is unfair. You know, they try their hardest not to commit plagiarism, but other friends are doing it. So what can be done about it? So if you have an idea to maybe implement a policy that can prevent this, why not? Okay, who knows if your, your idea on this policy pitch is going to be, is good enough. Uh, maybe the higher ups, the people in power of, of people of influence will actually listen to you and make use of the policy that you are pitching, okay? All right, and then once you have decided whether you want to pitch an idea, product or policy, you can brainstorm further on how to elevate this pitch to a better level or to a better quality, okay? First, you need to consider how to make the pitch interesting or relevant to your um, audience, okay? So this can, buy, this can be done in various ways and part of it will be in terms of outlining and also in terms of how to deliver your pitch later, okay? And then you have to do some research about your target audience or your market, for example, okay? Um, because sometimes, um, uh, according to a, a lot of interviews by, uh, uh, done on famous technocrats, right? Like, like Steve Jobs, like Mark Zuckerberg, uh, according to them, they, because these are the people who listen to idea pitch, business pitch from people all day long, right? So according to them, sometimes even the, the most perfect pitch will, I mean, perfect pitch in, in, in terms of presenting their ideas, okay, not the music perfect pitch. All right, sometimes even when people are able to do a perfect pitch, everything sounds good, but due to timing, due to unsuitability with the target audience, the pitch will still be unsuccessful, okay? So you need to be able to research a little bit about your target audience or your target market in order to make sure that your pitch is going to be efficient to them, okay? So if you know, for example, uh, your audience is going to be business people, then you have to present your pitch, your idea from a business point of view, okay? If you are presenting about uh, maybe a business plan that has something to do with very specific accounting terms, for example, but your audience are not accounting people, so you have to add, add, revise your strategy to present to these people. Maybe consider using layman terms in order to avoid people being confused when they are listening to your presentation, okay? Uh, basically, you have to tailor your message according to your audience, okay? If you are not able to find out about your audience specifically, if you are not able to maybe, you know, check them out on social media and so on, you are going into the pitching session blind. So the, the, the most reasonable thing I think that you can do is actually to keep it as simple and as general as possible with your pitch. Avoid using technical terms that are too complicated that people cannot understand and try to present it uh, in a way that will, ma will make it easier for everybody to follow through with your ideas, okay? Because if nobody can understand you, then even though you you, you coming, you're coming up with the best ideas, then it will be no point altogether, okay? 
And then you have to consider also what resources are available to you. Okay, uh, if you are starting up as a um, one man show, obviously money will be an issue. So you don't have much to go on with. So you might want to consider using only resources that are uh, freely available to you. You know, things like PowerPoint, for example, or uh, your own speaker when you're presenting videos and so on. Okay, but if you are allowed a certain amount of budget, for example, if you're doing the pitch uh, on behalf of your company, then you might want to consider investing in some devices that will actually elevate your pitch to be better. Maybe a projector, okay, maybe an internet connection that would allow you to do your presentation on uh, fancy softwares like Prezi and so on. Okay, anything that can actually help make your pitch stand out, why not? if you have the money to do it. If you don't, then always consider what else can be done uh, at, at, at a fraction of the cost, I would say, okay? So whether you have money or not, as long as you tailor it to the pitch that you are presenting, I think you will be okay, all right? So uh, hopefully everything is okay. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, you have decided the pitch. You are very clear on what it is. Uh, maybe you decided on an idea and then you uh, have decided on the area of the industry that you are going to be focusing on. Okay, next is for you to put all your ideas into a clear structure. So definitely you're gonna, ha you're gonna have to outline your presentation well, okay? So how exactly are you going to do this? Your, um, your outlining, yeah, basically, okay? So uh, first things first, why is it necessary for you to outline your presentation like any other presentation? Yeah? I will always say to students, even though you have the best ideas, but if there is no clear structure, there is no beginning, there is no middle, there's no ending to your pitch, it's still going to be a haywire and um, it's going to be messy and nobody will want to listen to you, okay? so. The, the, the best of ideas coupled with a very good structure will prevent confusion, will make the pitch very, very clear and will make it very easy for people to understand what you want to do. And chance, there will be higher chances of your pitch being accepted by your audience later, okay? So of course, there are a lot of different ways for you to structure your pitch according to your need. But for starters, maybe we can use these steps, okay? You start off with an introduction and then you move on to problem or issue. And then you can suggest your proposal. From your proposal, you move on to your uh, solution. From your solution, you can justify why your solution is ne uh, needed. So from then, uh, you go on into your conclusion. Okay. So we'll go in, uh, into this one by one. Yeah. So we start first with introduction. Okay. First things first. Uh, introduction is always important because you need to have some kind of beginning to, uh, of your pitch. You need to introduce your pitch to the audience. And this is re especially important if the pitch that you are presenting is something that is unfamiliar to your audience, okay? So it is good for you to introduce it a little bit uh, to your audience before you begin as a way to give them a little bit of background on um, where they need to, to, to start understanding your, your presentation, okay? So background information can come in various forms. So it is up to you how you want to explain it, but, uh, I would say the, the most important part with your introduction is you need to create a hook, okay? Not a literal hook, but um, something in your pitch presentation that will immediately capture your reader's attention, okay? And this can be done in various ways and various techniques. So there are a lot available out there, but I'm just going to focus on these four, okay? Uh, whether which one you want to use up to you later on, I'm just going to demonstrate how you can actually use it. Okay. First off, we have question. Next, we have personal experiences. Then we can also use quotes or expert opinion. Uh, and then we can also use statistics or research data. Okay. So whichever you use, as long as you know how to use them, you know which one is most the most impactful to your audience, then it will be okay, I think. Okay. All right, so in terms of question, why question is always um, one of the most effective ways for you to capture people's attention is, I think that's part of human nature. When somebody asks, asks a question, you would want to, to answer it or you would want somebody to answer it. 
because if a question is left unanswered, it leaves a very awkward situation. And politeness di dictates that we try to avoid that as much as we can. Okay, so that's why for a lot of effective uh, pitch presenters here, yeah, uh, you will see them start with questions sometimes. Okay, so for example, let's say for, for the sake of this uh, example for today, let's say I'm pitching an idea about making an app on how to help students to manage their assignments, for example. Okay, so starting from there, I can ask the question to the people. Okay, so when you ask the question, of course, definitely you have to play around with your vocal inflections. Okay, make sure every word is enunciated carefully so that the, the impact of the question really reaches your audience. Okay, so for example, you can say, do you have a mountain of tasks to do daily but don't really have the time to manage them all. Would you like to have a personal assistant that can do all that sorting for you at a fraction of the cost? Okay, so when you play around with your vocal inflections, that this will create interest for people and it will make the questioning much more effective compared to if you were reading it in a monotone. Do you have a mountain of tasks to do daily? We don't really have the time to manage them all. Uh, then it will beat the purpose of having a question in the first place. Okay, so when you ask a question to capture their attention, make sure you use also your body gestures and your facial expressions to emphasize the questioning a little bit more. Okay, so for example, uh, play around with your eyebrows, your, your, uh, for your, your frowning sometimes it can be applied. Okay, do you have a mountain of tasks to do daily, but don't really have time to do them all? Would you like to have a personal assistant that can do all that sorting for you? Okay, so if you're not used to this, it, sometimes for some people, this comes naturally, you know, the facial expressions. But if you don't know whether you're doing it right or not, then you're going to have to practice in front of a mirror. Okay, because, um, you know, sometimes we don't know whether we are doing the right thing or not, right? Sometimes what comes up out of our mouth and what is being shown on our face is completely different. So in, in order for you to make sure that you're doing it right, always practice this in front of a mirror, okay? So let's say, uh, this is a question. Let's say you do not want to use a question, okay? You want to use something that is closer to you, something that is more relatable to your audience, then you can always use a personal experience. Um, personal experience always works because I think human, um, mankind, humans, eh, um, wired to be social creatures, meaning, um, we, we like to interact with other humans, with other people. We cannot avoid it. And sometimes people value personal experiences, especially if it can be related to them uh, on a daily basis, for example. And let's face it, even though some people may not want to admit it, deep down, we are all, um, I would say, pachik and machik bawang. We always want to know what is happening with other people, their life stories, and so on. Because when we get to know that, then their stories and so on, we like to compare with our own experiences. So people are already inclined to do this. Why not put it to good use? So use a personal experience at the beginning of your pitch to draw in your audience um, to your pitch. So for example, you know, again, on the pitch of, let's say I'm pitching an app to manage students' uh, assignments. So I will use this personal experience, and when I deliver it, I would want to make sure that there is, there's a certain amount of dramatic effect applied to it, okay? Sympathy, empathy always works. So if you are able to use that properly, this is where your pitch will become much, much more effective, okay? That's why actors are very good um, spokesperson for products, for example. Okay, because they know how to use that dramatic effect, that acting to make the message more meaningful. Okay, so for example, something like this. As a student, I juggle a lot of things every day. My assignments, my club activities, and even my part-time job. Sometimes even sorting them all out would stress me, knowing I have to put them all in an order that I could barely able to track myself. That's why I am pitching today an app to manage students' assignments because I know how difficult it is, then this will definitely be a good solution to students, for example, okay? 
Uh, but when you want to use personal experience, you have to make sure that it is relevant to the pitch that you are presenting. Okay, if even if your personal experience is related and is full of dramatic effects and so on, but if it cannot be related to your pitch, then it will still be useless. Okay, for example, yeah, I had this one student <laughs> pitching uh, an idea once. Okay, uh, it was a very good beginning, I would say. Uh, he started off looking very solemn and kind of sad. He looked down, he took his time, and then he slowly raised his face up. Yeah, so, and then he started with something like this. My grandmother was the most important person to me. Why? Because my grandmother is the only person who would listen to me all day long. My parents are always working. So my grandmother is the only friend that I have. One day, she passed away. And that all stopped. So today, I'm going to pitch an idea about how to stop pollution. So at that moment of time, I, me and the other audience members, we were like looking at each other. Okay, so your grandmother passed away. That's a very good story. But how is that related to pollution? Did she die out of the pollution? So throughout the pitch, we were waiting for the student to actually uh, you know, link together the story, the personal experience and the pitch, but he didn't do that. Uh, so instead of starting with, a, he did start with a very effective hook, but because the hook was not really relevant to the pitch, it made the presentation awkward instead. Okay, so remember, if you're using a personal experience, always circle back to how it is relevant to your pitch. If it's not relevant, then do not even use it in the first place. Okay, all right. Moving on, if you do not uh, want to use a personal experience, if you want to be more serious, you can use quotes, that quotes, idioms, or expressions that people are familiar with, okay? For example, you can use something like this. If you fail to plan, then you are planning to fail. Then you can elaborate more on it, on it a little bit. This idiom perfectly describes why an app that can manage student assignments could actually be critical to students, okay? That would be one way of doing it. But if you want to do it maybe in a different manner, maybe an expert opinion, you can do that as well. You can quote the, the expert on that particular subject and you relate it back to your pitch, okay? So for example, you can say something like this. According to Jack Welch, the CEO of General Electric, a hugely successful company in the US, management is all about managing in the short term while developing for the long term. The same thing can be said about student assignments and you elaborate it even further, okay? So expert opinion can come in various forms, um, but you know you can use somebody like Jack Walsh here who's not really well known here, but in the US, uh, he's quite influential, I would say. Uh, but make sure that when you are referring to a statement or a quote from a, a prominent person, make sure he or she is related to the topic that you are presenting, okay? Uh, you cannot be giving a, a good statement. Management is all about managing in the short term, according to Rihanna, for example. Of course, the, the, the statement is still good. Rihanna is popular, but what does she have anything to do with management? Okay, uh, so if you were to do it that way, then another awkward situation will appear uh, for your hook later on. Okay, all right. Uh, if this is not uh, something that is uh, to your liking, you can also use the, the last one, statistics or research data. Um, this is always good because people are always attracted to things that are proven, okay? And statistics and research data is one way for you to show that you know what you're talking about, okay? But again, make sure the statistic and research data, number one, is legitimate. It comes from a legitimate source because in this day and age, Anybody can come up with statistics and research data and so on. Of course, some of you might be saying that, you know, and some of my students have already done this in the past. They bluff their statistics and their research data. Okay, if you want to do that, um, you can, I think, but you have to make sure nobody finds out later whether your research data or your statistics are legitimate or not. So that's why I, would, I always encourage my students, whenever you want to use statistics or research data, you have to make sure they are legitimate, okay? You do not want to risk people finding out that you're bluffing about those numbers that you are presenting, okay? Because the moment they find out that you are indeed bluffing, you will lose credibility on the subject and nobody would want to listen to you anymore in the future, 
regardless of whether your ideas are good or bad. Okay, so one example is something like this. Okay, uh, relate back the statistics or the statistics or the research data with your pitch. Okay, so a survey conducted in uh, from 2002 to 2005, for example, I'm rephrasing over here. A survey of over 63,700 undergraduates in the USA revealed that a lot of the university students are overwhelmed by the amount of assignments that they have to do in a semester. However, most of them admitted their own fault. They do not have any system to manage their deadlines properly. That is why this app that I am pitching today is critical for students. Okay, so relate it back, bridge it into your pitch presentation, and that is where the statistic can be very, very, um, I would say, impactful and meaningful to your presentation. Okay, so this is how uh, a few, these are a few examples of how you can actually begin your introduction of your pitch. Okay, once you are, you are done with the introduction, whichever you choose, okay, you can go back uh, to the second stage, which is to identify the problem or the key issue that you are present uh, that, that is related to your pitch. Okay, so first you need to state the current problem. What is happening in the status quo? Okay, so in my case, I would say that students are uh, facing a lot of difficulties keeping track with their assignments, particularly students who have to take like maybe eight, nine courses in a semester. One course will usually have like three or four assignments, right? So eight times four, there's 32 assignments in a semester. Definitely is going to be quite overwhelming to some students. So when you know that, that, that information already, present it in a way that you know will sound problematic to your target audience, okay? And emphasize on how this could be an issue in both the short and long terms, if you can, okay? Because um, when you, when you, Normally, problems will be short-term, but if you are able to emphasize the long-term uh, uh, hazards of it, then your problem, I would say, can be future-proof, meaning in the future, it's still going to be affecting other people. Then your pitch is going to be relevant in the new, even in the future as well, not just the present, okay? So, and then uh, you go back and relate to your audience. So, for example, it can be something like this. A lot of university students are aware that they need to manage their assignments. However, they just don't know where to start, especially for the new students who are unfamiliar with the university system. If this is not addressed immediately, it could definitely be a problem for the faculty in the long run. Okay, so I wrote, I wrote this down with the intention of maybe my target audience. Some of them might be uh, faculty members, for example. So then I can promote this app to them. Okay, so this is how you can actually pre uh, present your, your problem or your issue in a very direct manner. Do not, do not go uh, beat around the bush, yeah? go directly to the problem. Uh, it will be more impactful that way. Okay, and then once your problem or your issue has been clearly stated, then you go straight away to your proposal. Quickly explain to your audience how is um, the problem going to be settled in your side of the uh, presentation in your side of the pitch, okay? So when you suggest a proposal, remember to apply the KISS method, okay? In business, we always, you, we'll always see this, yeah? We're not asking you to kiss other people. We're asking you to keep it short and simple, okay? So example will be something like this, okay? It doesn't really even take one minute sometimes for people to suggest their proposal. So in my case, what can be done to help your average everyday students manage their assignments? The, un the answer lies within Donna, your personal assignment management app in the comfort of your own homes. Okay, uh, of, of course, for the purpose of this course, I am not developing this app for real. I'm just pitching the idea. Okay, who knows? In the future, maybe somebody listen to my, to my idea and they have a way of developing the app for real and then we can become partners in the long run. Okay, so, but the, the important thing is for you to suggest your proposal in a clear way and very in a very easy manner that will allow everybody to follow through and understand immediately, okay? So once this is uh, done, you can move on to the next stage. You can suggest a solution. How exactly does your proposal lead to a solution for the problem that you have identified earlier, okay? So um, 
you can actually refer to some Apple product presentations for this, yeah, because uh, you know every time Apple comes up with their uh, their own products, um, their products are actually very very complicated. iPhones um, and all those updates on on their softwares and so on, right? But when they do presentation, particularly to journalists and so on, you can see that they will try to explain it without the technical jargons, okay? Because if you use all those terms, um, although they are um, you know, the, the pride of the engineers developing it. Uh, sometimes when people don't understand you and they, uh, they, just, they ask you, please speak English. I am speaking English, but then you're using a lot of technical jargons. Nobody is, nobody's able to understand you. It's still not going to be useful, okay? So for example, for my app, my Donna app, even though the app is very complicated to develop, you know, you have to consider all the algorithms and so on. I'm not going to bore my audience with those. I'm just going to straight away explain how is it the app is going to solve the problem at hand, okay? So for, for example, it can be something like this, okay? Think of it, ladies and gentlemen, students are saying they don't know how to manage their assignments properly. Plus, many are not fond of the idea of carrying physical planners around. That's where Donna comes in. It is easily available in your phones, you don't really have to waste time putting it in your details one by one, okay? This is in reference to some of the planners that you are already having in your phones, yeah? You still have to go through the dates, so on and so forth. So my idea for this app is you just, you know, voice activate, uh, you just say what the assignment is, you see the date, and the app will automatically do the sorting for you, okay? So that's the, the gist of my idea, basically, all right? All you have to do is open the app, verbalize the title of your assignments, the deadlines, and voila, everything will be organized automatically. Okay, so that will be my solution for the, the problem. Okay, after you are done with the solution, then you can start justifying why the solution is viable. Okay, so uh, there are multiple ways for you to do this. Yeah, you, you can do um, uh, the simpler way, which is to exemplify how the solution can be effective. Okay. But in my case, I, I prefer to compete or to compare with other products of a similar nature. I think that will be uh, much more memorable to the audience later. Okay, in my case, for example, when I want to introduce, let's say if I want to introduce a personal assistant app, okay, there are already available um, apps similar to that in the market. You know, um, the most popular one will be Alex, uh, Alexa and Siri. Okay, so when I want to compare my app with those other apps that are already prominent in the market, this is where I need to uh, distinguish how my app is different compared to those ones that are already available in the market. Okay, so uh, you can also go a little bit further and explain exactly how your solution is better than the, the, the other apps, for example. Okay, so I will justify it in this manner. All right, yes, we are aware that Alexa and Siri are already out there. A lot of people are using them, but they are not specifically designed to manage student assignments the way Donna is. Plus, Donna will not be soliciting services that you never ask for anyway. This is me taking a, taking a swipe at Alexa, eh? <laughs> okay? For example, because Alexa is a Google service, so sometimes it will advertise on a lot of products through your requests and so on. It, it analyzes your preferences, right? And um, it will give suggestions. I know some, some people say they're just suggestions. There's no harm. But for people like me, it can be very annoying sometimes. Uh, so I use that as a point to promote my app a, a little bit further. So now I'm saying that Donna is doing what Alexa can do minus the annoying advertisements and suggestions. Okay, so why not, all right? Uh, so you get exactly what you sign up for, an assignment manager that does exactly what, what it is designed to do, and they're not going to be nagging you to, um, you know, subscribe to services that you don't need in the first place, okay? So this is how I uh, try to make my pitch a little bit more different compared to my competitors, okay? Because in this day and age, uh, particularly when you're trying to pitch a product, chances are a lot of ideas of your products will already be available in the market anyway. So compare, how is your app, how is your product or your idea better than the current ones that's already available? 
and then it will, uh, will leave a lasting mark on your audience, okay? Once your justification is done, then you can go straight away into your conclusion, okay? Reinforce your proposal, why it is needed, and how is it going to be useful to your target audience? Again, so something like this. And then again, you want to end your conclusion on a, on a high note. So again, use the dramatic effect. To some of you, maybe Donna is yet another run-of-the-mill app in the market. But to the struggling university students out there, overwhelmed beyond belief with their never-ending assignments, extracurricular activities, and part-time jobs, this could be their lifeboat. This, this could be the key to them staying afloat to survive. So go for Donna. Okay. So when you apply this kind of strategies, of course, I would say it is going to be um, impactful for your audience because sympathy, empathy always works. Because we are humans, we deal with emotions uh, daily. Okay. And people tend to be sympathetic to, 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 to this kind of causes. So why not use it? Uh, to your advantage okay so that is basically how you can organize your uh your pitch okay once you have organized and outlined properly your pitch then maybe you can move on to the next stage which is to practice your delivery and do the actual delivery of your pitch itself okay so when it comes to practicing your pitch yeah um i would say these are some of the things that i think could help to elevate your pitch a little bit further compared to your, your other opponents or your competitors, okay? Firstly, prepare a visually appealing presentation aid, okay? Whether you're using PowerPoint or Prezi or other kinds of uh, visual aids, you can, whatever you want to use, but make sure it is visually appealing, yeah? And, you know, this term visually appealing can be very, very subject subjective. So, um, I would say having a little bit of knowledge about art could be useful in this. Because sometimes when I say to people, to, to my students, yeah, visually appealing presentation aid. So what is visually appealing to one person may not be the same to another. So I think knowledge, again, knowledge and in art a little bit can actually help you with this. Okay. So first up, if you're using the, the most typical um, uh, visual aid that people will use will be PowerPoint. Okay. So go back to the name of the software. Yeah. PowerPoint, it's not a power paragraph, it's not a power essay, okay? In your visual aid, use as minimal words as you can, all right? Always just simply use key points to help you remember what will be the point that you are going to elaborate in your presentation, okay? It wouldn't help if you put, you know, a wall of words into your PowerPoint and then you will end up reading the slide or even worse, you are presenting, your audience are reading your slides. So then, What's the purpose of you standing there presenting? You might as well just give your slides to your audience for them to read on their own, isn't it? Okay, so make sure your presentation aid is not doing the presentation for you. Remember, it is an aid, it's, it's an assistant. Okay, so do not let it outshine you. It is necessary to make your pitch more interesting um, to, to your audience, but make sure it doesn't outshine you in the presentation itself. Okay, next, use rele relevant high resolution pictures. Now, this is something that I have to remind my students a lot. Okay, sometimes when students, uh, when you want to include pictures, sometimes some pictures can really, really uh, be good in terms of emphasizing certain points. You know, a picture of uh, two people shaking hands and so on. But if the picture is grainy at best or low resolution or even worse, you put it on your slides and the dimension of it is, all over the place. You know, some students, they like to squeeze their pictures or they stretch it out. That is not going to look nice, yeah? When you put it that way, um, your slides is just going to look unprofessional, okay? So consider finding uh, pictures, if you want to put them into your, your slides, pictures that are nice in quality, doesn't break easily. Uh, so, you know, as long as it's clear, it serves the purpose, why not? Uh, just do not put pictures where it is not necessary. Like, you know, some one time I got a student presenting a pitch and then while she was presenting in the, in the PowerPoint, there's a GIF image, you know, the moving pictures of Tweety Bird flying around. So instead of watching her, I was 
spinning around with, with you. <laughs> okay, so that takes away the attention from the presenter. So consider that as well, right? And then uh, you need to look and think of your color scheme, your design and the layout of your presentation aid, uh, also very, very important. Um, there are a lot of courses available out there and a lot of pointers, free pointers available on YouTube on how to make effective PowerPoint slides, for example. So go through them, it doesn't hurt. Sometimes what, what you think is nice to you may not be the same to other people. Like for example, you know, the, the general rule, if you use a light colored background, do not use a light colored font, right? So it has to be um, contrasting to one another, okay? And sometimes some students mistake, and they, they, they think that when they use striking colors, it, it will capture the audience um, attention. Yes, for example, this, this, I was remember this one student one time, the background is like very bright orange, and the, the, the writing is very bright red. Yes, it captured the audience's attention, but in a negative way. Everybody was like, uh, okay, the colors are very bright, but very hard for us to see also. So yeah, consider your color scheme and so on. That's why when you, um, when you open PowerPoint, yeah, you can look at the features available. Some templates that are already available in PowerPoint, they already come with suitable color scheme. Okay, because those color schemes do not just, they, do, they didn't just pick it randomly, you know, because they have designers who actually decided which color scheme suits better for this design or for this layout. So if you do not have this um, knowledge in art on what's balanced and what's not, so just use the template that is already suggested to you by PowerPoint. Why not? Okay, and then <clears throat> of course you're using, you're showing. Uh, words on your presentation aid, try to minimize grammar or language errors, okay? Particularly with people who are um, paying attention to this, sometimes, you know, even one typo and they, it will spoil the entire presentation, particularly people who are, you know, uh, very, people who are grammar Nazis, for example, okay? They will just be focused on that one typo and that's all they will remember for, for the rest of your presentation, okay? So once you have prepared your presentation aid, it doesn't hurt to get someone to go through them and make, make, make sure that there's no grammar or language errors basically, all right? Uh, that is in terms of your presentation aid. Next, in terms of language, <clears throat> okay? First things first, um, always draft your pitch. I know some students are very, very confident with their presentation skills, with their pitching. They think uh, that, you know, some students are very good that they can actually do uh, a pitch presentation uh, out of the, you know, just, just, just like that spontaneously. But the problem is when you do it spontaneously um, and you practice it spontaneously also, every single time you practice, it will be different. So it's not going to be consistent and then you will not know how to improve, where to improve. Where did you do wrong? Because it keeps changing all the time, okay? So even though you are really, really confident with the skill, I would advise you, <coughs> sorry, I would advise you to draft your pitch first. Put it on paper and then put it into a clear structure. That way, when you practice later, you can actually follow through uh, the step-by-step -step of your presentation and it will make it clearer, okay? And then in terms of the language that you're using also, Try as much as you can to use simpler, uh, simple words or sentence structures, okay? Pitch, a pitch presentation is not the time for you to wow people with your vocabulary or your knowledge on grammar, okay? Maybe one or difficult words, okay, but not too, mu not too much because then people will simply assume that you're showing off. And then if you keep on using all these difficult words and so on, if people don't understand you, then what's the point, isn't it? Even worse, sometimes uh, some students, they use um, all these jargons that they, them they themselves don't understand and they use it wrongly, okay? So my advice is stick to what you know, okay? Use simple words, sim uh, simple sentence structures. You make it very friendly for all your target audience later and they would appreciate it, okay? 
And then apply transitional cues in your presentation when you're moving from the stage stages just now, from your introduction, you start with maybe, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, and then when you move to the next stage, let's move on to my next presentation or, or my next stage, my, my, propose, my problem or issue. Ladies and gentlemen, I am now going, going to explain my proposal. I'm going to now move on to my solution. So by having these transitional cues, it actually helps your audience to clearly follow your presentation step by step. Okay, and it makes your structure even clearer for people to follow through. So always use it and you can vary your transitional cues and a lot of them, uh, a lot of examples are available on the web. So why not use it? Okay, the words like more over, furthermore, hitherto, so on and so forth. Okay, and then last but not least, once you have prepared your uh, pitch, okay, your, uh, your draft and so on, you can always get somebody to proofread your work again, similar to what you are supposed to do with your visual aid. Uh, get somebody with good command of the language to go through your work and make sure there is no uh, errors and so on. Okay. Um, some people will say, never mind, I can do this myself. Um, that's not really advisable, yeah, people. Even though you're very, very confident with your language skills, when you're doing it yourself, when you're drafting it yourself, usually your mind will be focused on the content. And then you will miss out certain mistakes, errors in your draft draft later on okay so always get somebody with fresh eyes to go through your work and make sure they um they are able to actually identify what areas are problematic in your draft and so on okay so uh an example um uh, of a draft uh, i think i will show to you to you later uh, but generally other things that i mentioned just now when you put it into a draft that will be complete already okay once you're done with this, your draft, okay, you can start uh, practicing and make sure you be confident when you practice, okay? You maintain eye contact with your audience. Maintain eye contact and staring are completely different things, yeah? Okay, maintaining eye contact meaning when you look at them with ease. Do not stare. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm going to present to you. Now, this is trying too hard. This is just creepy. Okay, maintain meaning with a relaxed face. You look at your audience, smile. Okay, and then you can look around with your audience one by one, but do not look off too quickly. Okay, um, if, you, if you're nervous, um, what can you do? Some, it depends on some presenters, how you best manage your nerves. Some people will just look at the back. Okay, or if you, you know, I used to be far-sighted, for example, I just simply take off my glasses and... I wouldn't be able to see anyone. So I'll just fake my eye contact, okay? Uh, but uh, for those of you who can see very, very clearly, then you're gonna have to learn how to maintain eye contact with other people, okay? Use comfortable, relaxed body language, okay? Your posture, the way you stand, the way you use your, your hand, for example, when you speak to people, do not, do not slouch, okay? Uh, because posture is always attractive for people to, to look at. So that's why maintain a very high body posture and practice in front of a mirror to maintain it. Okay, because if you don't, it will look very awkward when you stand on stage later or when you are standing in front of a crowd delivering your presentation. Okay, use hand gestures, but sparingly to emphasize certain points. So not always, not all the time. This will be distracting. Okay, so just at the right moment, at the right time. For some speakers, yeah, some experienced speakers that I've uh, witnessed, when I uh, they delivered very good speeches every single time. And then when I looked at their draft, they even actually put markers where they should actually use their hand gestures. So that's how they strategize yeah, to that point where every single hand gesture that they want to, to use, uh, they actually put it into their draft and they practice it. Uh, so I think as long as it is effective, why not? It may not work for you, but um, I guess apply whatever it is that you think is relevant to your presentation, what works for you will also be fine, okay? How do you know whether it is acceptable or not? Maybe you can get a test audience and get, get your feedback on that, okay? So next you go into the practice session, okay? Always practice, practice, practice. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt to practice. In fact, it will even make your presentation better, okay? 
So be aware to enunciate your words carefully. Your pronunciation has to be crisp, has to be correct, and it has to be paced well enough that people can hear you speaking. Every word is clear enough for them to follow through. Okay, if you speak too fast, sometimes people will be confused. What is it that you're speaking exactly? Okay, speaking like a bulletin is not going to be helping anyone. All right, uh, so pace yourself word for word, but not to the point that, okay, everyone, today I'm going not like that. Okay, so manage your pace well. That's why for some speakers, when they do presentations, they like to record themselves every single time. And then they will evaluate whether this pace is good enough or not. Okay, you will, you know, if you do this, if you record yourself presenting, presenting and you rewatch it again, sometimes you will cringe. You know, like, is that really how I presented? I thought I presented like, like Bill Gates, but then I look like a clown. It's normal in the beginning, but as you go on along, as you become more acquainted with this method, you will see that it will actually be very, very helpful to you. Okay, next, vary your vocal inflections. Apply different intonations into your speech. How do you find this out? Again, by recording yourself. If your presentation is monotonous all the way, that is going to be very dull and it's going to be very boring for your audience to listen to. So sometimes apply the high pitch, sometimes the middle pitch, sometimes the lower pitch. If you don't know how to inflect your voices carefully, then maybe it could be advisable for you to go to vocal classes. Vocal classes are not just for singing, everyone. You can also learn how to control your voice to emphasize different points at different times. Okay. Next, you deliver in front of a mirror or in front of a friend as a target audience and then get feedback from them. Do they think what they have done so far is good? If it's not, what can be improved? Okay. Uh, when you do it in front of a mirror also, in a way, in the beginning, it will be awkward, but after some time, it will actually help you to be more confident with your presentation. Okay. And, you know, seeing you present for yourself it will actually in real time. Yeah. It, with, using a video, you will see it later. Right. But when you practice in front of a mirror, it will actually make you more aware of how exactly you are presenting at that particular moment of time, exactly live in front of you. Right. So, you know, when you're using certain gestures too much, then people might make fun of you like, what are you, Karam Singh Walia, uh, for example. Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. That is his signature. But for you, if it doesn't, you know, in the beginning, you have to understand Karam Singh Walia got, got a lot of uh, a flag for it. I mean, people, a lot of people make fun of, of him. Um, but he has been known for years before people started accepting that 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 is his signature, right? But for you, if you keep on doing the same hand gesture, then people don't know you yet. So they might, instead of focusing on your pitch, they will just be distracted and making fun of you. Okay, so again, looking at the mi mirror will help you to vary your hand gestures and so on. Okay, and of course, time yourself. All right, very important. When you deliver a pitch, um, a pitch doesn't have to be like a presentation. Presentation, you will have to deliver a lot of things in, 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 and you are given a, a lot of time to do it. But at a, for a pitch presentation, three to five minutes should already be good enough. Okay? So if your pitch within the uh, three or five minutes, you think it's not, still not good enough, then maybe you can add more items or edit out certain unimportant things. It really depends. Okay, because when you draft it on paper and when you're delivering it, that will be complete, completely different things altogether. Because when you deliver it, that's when you know how to apply your vocal inflections, where to slow down, where to go faster. So timing will be different. Okay, so always time yourself. Yeah. And then uh, once the practice session is done, then it is the time for you to deliver the pitch as how you have practiced. So, um, do you okay the, the typical question that I get from students do we have to memorize the pitch presentation? That really depends on you. As a presenter, do you think it's necessary or not? Some people work really well when they have memorized it, their, their draft. So if it works for you, why not? But some people like to have that adrenaline rush when they presented 
without memorizing. They're just remembering the key points only. Okay, so if it works for you, why not? Okay, so there's no, to me, I say there is no one right way of doing it. As long as your target audience is happy, why not? Okay, for me personally, uh, I will always apply the advice given my, by my, um, my teacher in school. He was my debate coach at, at the time. So you always say, you know, debate is also kind of like pitching ideas, right? But the difference is you want to pitch an idea and you want to win over other people. So my, my coach at the time will always say that you don't really have to memorize it. You just practice it enough until it becomes natural to you. So how, how much practice would you need to be natural? My teacher would say 40 times. So that is something that I have held on to up until today. And so far, it has been very successful, very efficient for me. So maybe you could try it. Okay, because uh, once you have practiced for up till 40 times, yeah, I don't think you need to memorize it anymore. It will come naturally to you. So why not? And then the most important thing when you deliver, always learn to manage your nerves. Being nervous during a pitch presentation is completely normal. Okay, because we are humans. Um, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Learning how to control it is what matters the most. Okay, some people, you know, they apply different strategies. Sometimes they, you know, um, will hold their hands to a fist. Sometimes they will grab something in their hands while they're presenting. The, so, you know, they, they put it in their hands and they grab it and then they go down here. Okay. Uh, if you watch Grey's Anatomy, for example, as, uh, this, there's this one doctor always nervous before she performs a surgery. So to get the confidence, she will stand like a superhero looking like that. I've done that before. Could work for some people. However, uh, whatever strategies that you think can help you to manage your nerves is always important. Because, you know, it doesn't matter if you have practiced enough, if you have practiced a lot, but during the presentation day or the presentation time, if you are unable to control your nerves, everything will falter and pretty much everything will go to waste also. All right. So uh, how to manage your nerves? I think if you are courageous enough to do pitch presentation in public many times, slowly, gradually, bit by bit, you will gain the confidence and nerves will no longer be an issue for you. In fact, you will be... I would say, hey, enthusiastic. You can't wait to present in front of people. Why can't they come any sooner? Let me present to them now, up to that point. If you have done a lot of pitch presentation, okay? So that's, uh, th those are some of the strategies that you can apply to improve your delivery, okay? But next, the, the, the next step is once you have delivered your pitch, what can you do is you look back at your uh, pitch presentation and you can go through an, uh, a feedback analysis. This can be done after the pitching process and this is also very important for you to uh, learn to control your, your uh, improvements and so on. Okay, so you can get feedback from your audience uh, in two ways. Number one, after the pitch is, is, is done, you can promptly ask them to get their feedback if they have the time. Uh, if there's no one else presenting after you, okay? But if there's, there's, uh, they don't have that much of a time or there's no space for you to do that, always carry with you maybe a name card or a business card and leave your contacts with your uh, listeners, with your audience, so that they can maybe email you their feedback. You cannot force them to give their feedback because um, they're not obliged to do that, but you can ask them nicely. I am new to this. I would really um, appreciate any kind of feedback that you have. And honest feedback will be even better. Okay, so you maybe you give them their card, your email perhaps, and they can mail it to you afterwards. All right. And after you have gathered their feedback, you can put it into an analysis. And uh, one of the best analysis methods that you can use is the SWOT analysis. Very simple. Okay, SWOT. Okay, based on your presentation, what are the feedback that people give that are considered as your, your, your strengths? Okay, maybe your voice is very clear. Maybe your visual aid is very, very effective. So if those are part of your strengths, 
keep it for the next presentation. Okay, but the weaknesses that you have identified from your presentation, do something about it. What areas do you need to improve on? If, if let's say your audience say you appear nervous, then obviously you need to learn strategies on how to maintain your, or how to control your composure when you are delivering your pitch, okay? And then opportunities, what are your goals? What, what comes after this? You have learned your strengths and your weaknesses. What else will you do after this? Are you going to keep with the same pitch or are you going to improve it or are you going to move to a different idea all together? Okay, and then <clears throat> identify also the threats. What kind of obstacles do you think will come after this, after this presentation? Okay, a uh, simple thing would be, for example, in my case, I would simply say, you have done the presentation, so people are already aware of your idea. So the, all, the immediate threat always is that, you know, now it's open for, for people to use in, this, in the same way, copycats, okay, because, Sometimes this happens, yeah? People come to pitch presentations because they want ideas. And from your idea, they thought of a different idea that is better than yours. So that could be a threat to you. So why not think about it? And if it happens, you can also use that as a way, as an opportunity for you to improve as well, okay? So the SWOT analysis can be done on your own or with the help of a friend. But usually I would uh, encourage my students to get friends to help them with this. Because if you're doing analysis of yourself, nothing wrong with that, it can be done, but you, you will be uh, much, much of your analysis will be self-serving, eh? SS, or in Malay, you say short sendiri. Okay, oh, everything is strengths. I have no weakness, so I'm so happy. Okay, so it cannot be. When, when, whenever there's a presentation, there's, there's always pros and cons. Even a professional presenter, uh, people who have done pitch, uh, pitching ideas for, for years, there will always be room to improve, okay? The, the day that you, you cannot find any weaknesses anymore, um, you shouldn't be too happy. That simply means that your journey is coming to a stop, <laughs> okay? So that's not really a good thing, I think, because it's not fun that way when you don't have anything else to improve on. It's like playing a game that no longer has any levels after you finish with the boss, right? So now you have to move on to a different game altogether, a different platform, okay? So as a final word from me, I will say that success is not, uh, this is coming from Winston Churchill, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts, okay? Um, in the beginning, maybe your pitching idea may not be so successful the way you, you wanted it to be, uh, but that's part of the part and parcel of learning basically okay we've um, even the most successful people experience failures a lot okay the difference is what do you do with it okay when you experience failure do you become discouraged do you go to the edge uh, to, to the edge of your bed and start crying you go to the corner of your room and start being gloomy all over or do you take that failure as a learning a step, a problem that you need to overcome. Okay, so that that is the kind of mentality that builds successful people. All right. In the beginning, of course, you will not be so good at idea pitching, but once you have done it a lot, sometimes you will be you will become so good at it that you don't even need to draft your ideas at all. You have done it so much so that you can do it spontaneously without even a single preparation. Okay, you go to work, your boss say, okay. Pitch me an idea right now. Okay, you come to the front and you immediately deliver a speech. But of course, that usually takes years of practice. Okay, it cannot be done uh, immediately. All right. So uh, basically, that's it for me. Um, and the, the slides, I am supposed to give credit for slides go for the, the slides that I'm using right now. Uh, but before we end, uh, maybe I would like to show a, a sample of... Um, a draft that you can actually use as an example. Okay, I don't know whether your lecturers uh, have given this to you or not, but basically everything that I have explained to you just now, you can put this into a simple structure like this for your draft. So what is your introduction? What is your problem? So you put exactly what is it, okay? On the right-hand side, this is your proposal, your solution, 
This is your draft justification. And then finally, your conclusion to reinforce your proposal. Okay, so if I zoom out, uh, it's actually very a very simple draft, I would say. You don't even have to come up with a, like a full-on speech for this. Okay, all right. So um, basically, that's, that's it for me. All right, so thank you, everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, then you can uh, maybe ask from the moderator, and I'll try to answer as much as I can. All right, back to you, Mr. E. Okay, thank you so much, Jefata, um, our distinguished speaker for today's session. Uh, joining us today as well, we also have uh, Encik Zakaria, one of the lecturers teaching, or Encik Zak, right? Uh, one of the lecturers teaching uh, ELC 5.0. Okay, thank you so much for that insightful sharing uh, from Encik Fata. At the moment, uh, we just receive a lot of emojis from the students on uh, YouTube, you know? Uh, showing support for this for this program but but no question at the moment but then again um maybe we can also have you know uh if let's say the buddies if you have anything to ask to Chepata, do we have anything any question from the buddies um okay Nchi, Nchi is, uh, mr zach yes please, right, um please. i have a question actually am i audible right now yeah Okay, all right. Assalamualaikum, Mr. Fatah. Hello. Okay, um, I have a question. Um, I remember when you were talking about eye contact just now. and But as we all know, especially for this course, this assessment is done virtually. So do you have any tips or hints on how, on with regards to eye contact, when we do a virtual pitch? Because we won't, we're not looking at a, uh, the students will not be looking at, at an actual audience. They'll be looking at this piece of thing right here, known as a camera. So, do you have any tips or hints on that? Okay, good question. Because we're doing it virtual, right? So, my advice is for you to always look at your camera. Okay? Uh, because um, right now, the, 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 the window to other people's world, your audience world, will be the camera. And that will be why I, I think that will be the, should be the main focus for you when you are presenting. Okay, because sometimes, uh, because we have gone through ODL for what, four consecutive semesters now. Okay, so some, sometimes uh, I get students who do pitch uh, presentation online like this. Like they're reading a news, uh, like they're becoming a newscaster or something like that. So I know you are reading from your text. So that doesn't really help with, you know, showing that you are confident. Okay, so apply different strategies that can actually help you to look at your camera. Okay, that for example, once I had this student who, who did this before, all the way through, he actually looked at his camera and I asked him, did you memorize your, your, your pitch? He said, no, I actually pasted it on my wall and I just, you know, the, this, the, the cue cards are all above his camera, right above his camera. So he is actually faking his eye contact with the camera uh, so it didn't really show. So I guess that was really effective. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. When we talk about, you know, delivering your speech and also eye contact and doing it online, um, surely we will, will be having some students who will be like reading out the speech, you know, like, like as if we don't know that you put your speech behind your, your, your webcam or your laptop and then you'll be reading it out, you know, as much as you feel that you're actually looking at the camera, but we can see the slight difference of your, uh, you know, your, the way you look at the camera and the way you look at your, your the speech that you pasted behind it. I guess experienced lecturers like us after having gone through, you know, four consecutive semesters uh, on doing it online, we should be able to differentiate this, the students who can actually deliver the speech and also not to mention the pacing, you know, students who, who, who read out the speech the pacing will be, I think, a little bit faster as compared to those who are actually doing it naturally. Can, all right. Thank you so much, Encik Fata. Do we have any other question from? We don't really have question from the YouTube live, but not sure about our buddies here. Do we have anything? Do you, do you guys have anything to ask, Encik Fata? Uh, just, just maybe to add on that, yeah, Mister E. Mm. Um, because a lot of lecturers know when the students are reading from the the the. Uh, cue cards or the, from the speech and so on. 
That's why we go back to my point just now about putting only key keywords in your visual aid. Okay. Uh, I find that a lot of students have this bad habit. They put everything on the on the slides and they, they read everything. That is not uh, something that I think would be advisable for them to do. Because when you read from the slides, is I think it's kind of like insulting the intelligence of your audience, right? They can read for themselves. The purpose of them coming to the pitch presentation is to listen to you. So the same goes when you're doing this online. Okay, maybe if you want to put um, your, your speech, your visual aid behind your camera and so on, you can do that. But make sure you do it the same way that like I mentioned just now, only the key points. Mm -hmm. The rest of the explanation should come from you. The key points is only reminders, you know, sort of like bookmarks. What are the points you're going to say now, the next one and the following one. But the explanation should come directly from you. No reading, please. All right, thank you. So uh, since we don't really have questions from the students, I guess uh, Mr. Fata, you know, he has presented, uh, you know, well <laughs> for, for, for the topic. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, for the students, I have actually shared the link for you to uh, fill out the forms, the feedback form. I would appreciate if you can fill out the uh, feedback form. And don't forget to check your attendance because I've been informed by some of your lecturers, um, you, you have classes. Uh, from 10 to 11, eh, sorry, 12. And, you know, your lecturers are actually using this slot for, for the mass lecture for week eight. So attendance is still compulsory. So do please check your attendance on new future. Yeah. And also, I hope that by uh, listening and watching in Chiefata's uh, presentations and this sharing, this sharing session will benefit you in any ways, uh, particularly in helping you out, uh, number one, in understanding on how to go about your uh, second assessment, which will be the, um, the pitch, and also um, in, in doing it. That means uh, you know how to, 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 to prepare your, your, yourself for the... Oh, Amira, yes, please. Amira. Uh, so sorry part? to... Uh intersect but can i ask sure uh okay let's say i'm doing a pitch about a certain software or application can i do a real-time demonstration as in while i'm speaking i am showing it and this at the same time like how do i use this application or software um okay hi amira uh well i guess uh that's, that's a good question. Um, well, I guess that really depends on your timing, okay? Whether or not you can demonstrate whether the software can actually be used or not in real time, you have to go back to the time limit given uh, for the task of the presentation. If, if your demonstration can be squeezed into your five minutes, then why not, okay? But usually that could uh, be problematic because I, I've had some students who try to demonstrate their ideas and products, but uh, usually they will exceed the five minutes given. Mm. So if that is the case, then maybe I think you should consider just explaining it. But if you can demonstrate it in a simple manner without exceeding the time limit given, then why not? Okay? All right. Thank you, Nchipata. All right. Thank you, Amira, for the question. Anyone else? Okay, so I guess we have come to an end of our session. Thank you so much once again. I would like to extend our gratitude to uh, Encik Fata for you know um, sharing with us your expertise, you know your 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 um, talk on uh, pitching, idea pitching, and hopefully it will benefit the students. Um, we actually reached uh, how many viewers just now? The highest Encik Aizat, eight um, hundred something. I think it was eight hundred. 67 yeah okay almost reaching 900 viewers so hopefully this will help the students so uh also i would like to mention that this is actually uh, part of our collaborative uh, teaching project where we invite lecturers uh, from other faculties from other departments even campus so in this case in Chefata is actually uh, a, a uh, gbi our english lecturer from um, uitm negeri sembilan so the reason is we just, we just want to have that sharing session where sometimes when we listen to others, we'll get more you know, information, uh, more things that can actually help us 
and it's good actually uh, given the fact that we are doing it online you know so everything is 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 easy now so we can just um, be at the comfort of our home and um, or office in that sense yeah because i think the lectures are all in the office <laughs> but the students are at home so you know you can but at, at the same time we can have in Fata all the way from the greece milan to actually you know share his 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 thoughts and ideas on on this topic so once again Encik Fata, thank you so much for joining us and um, to the suit oh okay okay i have a question from arif yes arif why not? I have a question. Can I use PowerPoint recorded presentation? But as we know, we need to, let me just read the chat. We need to, um, as we know, we need to control the slides as well. So my visual appearance cannot be from head to knee. So only from head to chest. Is it all right? I think that is more than okay because when you're doing body gestures, it's not going to involve your knees, right? So I think, um, uh, when you're doing, uh, if let's say uh, you want to use a recorded PowerPoint, uh, that is also allowed, I think. It really depends if you know how to do video editing, okay? Because uh, a lot of my students are also doing that, uh, but they know how to present using uh, PowerPoint and then they convert it into a video, okay? Mm -hmm. So if you know how to do it, why not? As long as the content of the pitch is clear, I don't see why that could become a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, because uh, when, when we're doing ODL, right, we have to understand that some students really cannot present their pitch uh, live in, during live sessions due to poor internet connection and so on. So the alternative that I would give to students who are facing this problem is you send in your recorded video presentation, but make sure that, uh, you, that there is a part of you presenting and at the same time, there is a a visual aid at the background that we can actually see and refer to, okay? You can actually refer to um, a lot of ex uh, samples on YouTube, yeah? A lot of uh, ELC 590 students, senior students have actually posted their videos online and some of them have come up with very good uh, PowerPoint recorded videos and then they put it on YouTube. So you just have to look at the samples there. I think that would be good enough. Okay. All right, thank you, Arif, for your question. Thank you, Jafata, for the response. Okay, if I can just add on a little bit, um, it's okay for you to record yourself, but then again, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Zach here, you know, there's another issue, and that is whether you know we can hear what you what you are delivering. Uh, all right, because uh, unless you have a good voice projection, that would be something else, or you know, uh, a microphone uh, attached to you as you're delivering, you know, to uh, your your speech. Uh, and also, uh, students have to remember that your the center of your assess, uh, sorry the center of the speech is your speech itself. That means you can the uh, uh, the, the the visual it should not be the center of your speech, because I realize that students have the tendency, particularly those who like to share you know their slides, and they'll they'll read out the slides and then and then the video. Your, of your presentation will be smaller and then the, the, the slides will be even bigger. And it looks as if that we are actually focusing on the slide instead of the speech. But you must remember this is English for oral presentations, which means that we're looking at your presentation, uh, your, your delivery, your speech delivery. Okay, uh, so visual aid is actually part of it. All right, uh, so this is where you really need to manage well, you really need to plan out well, not at the very last minute. Although, you know, um, uh, you will be assigned on particular weeks, you know, for instance, your second assessment will be in week 10. So uh, you will have to come up with that video presentation in week 10. But uh, planning, you know, can be done earlier. Uh, in fact, right after today, <laughs> after Jifata's session, you can plan plan already for your for your second assessment okay all right thank you so much and i guess uh, if let's say you still have uh, some other questions or along the way you can actually you know um, ask your questions uh, to your class lecturers hopefully that they are more than capable to actually uh, give uh, responses don't worry okay and uh, to the students i wish all the best and good luck for your second assessment all right and uh, Tunci Fata, uh, once again, uh, thank you so much for your sharing session and to the students, thank you so much for joining in. You know, we, we receive about almost 900 viewers and uh, hopefully there'll be more 
of this and I hope the students can actually fill out the feedback form that would be good for us. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll see you guys, inshallah. All right. So that will be all. Thank you.